Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. My name is David Bonson. I am the Chief Investment Officer here at the Bonson Group. And I am excited to be sitting in my New York studio. Uh, there's been you know, a fair amount of travel. I think, where was I last week? I think I was in San Francisco. I've been in Palm Beach. I've been in Grand Rapids. Uh, I've been back in Newport Beach over Thanksgiving week and the week after. So, you know, kind of a lot going on the last couple of weeks. And you may have, if you're watching the video, you may have seen me in, in a handful of different spots. Um, but one thing that has continued is a pretty vigorous inquiry into this notion about what risks are real and what risks are, are uh, exaggerated in the markets right now. So I really enjoyed last week's Dividend Cafe. I thought it was a kind of helpful 18 to 24 month history to go back over the 2020 and 2021 time period around various uh, ebbs and flows of the coronavirus and what that's meant with markets. And at the time we were dealing with last week, this highly volatile week, coming off of a 900 point down day the day after Thanksgiving, as news of this Omicron uh, variant got out. And um, so I had a lot to say about that last week. And then I had a little bit to say on what, what is ironic to me in that the certain risks that I thought were being ignored while other risks were being really overly uh, played into it. Now, here we are, as I'm recording, the market's up about 1,250 points on the week. It has now made back the entirety of that week of volatility from the variant. And uh, I've written in DC today, every day this week, and we've discussed at length, especially last Friday's Dividend Cafe, why I didn't think that the COVID variant news was much of a market story. And, and really, if I'm being fully candid, because I don't ever want to hold back for people that listen to or watch or read the Dividend Cafe, and most importantly, I don't want to hold back what I say to clients. Um, I, it wasn't that I thought it was overdone. I thought that it being done at all was, was misguided, that there was just simply no market story there at all, none. And yet, um, a couple of things have happened that I want to talk about. To, to further unpack what I do believe is an important market story right now. And after I had written most to Dividend Cafe very early this morning before the market opened, as I came into my office today, there was a, uh, something that happened that caused me to add this into Dividend Cafe. And it's not a very big deal, but it's just I thought was, first of all, borderline hysterical. But second of all, um, really quite, um, I don't know, metaphorical to this thing I'm talking about, is there was an individual uh, who was trying to, you know, we have like, I think it's six, it might be eight actually, eight elevators in our building. We're at the Gray Bar building in New York City, next door to Grand Central at 44th Street on Lexington Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. And there's eight elevators to come up to where our floor is. So this whole, whole kind of bank of elevators. And one of them was coned off. The walls were scraped out. And it was a big sign up saying out of order. I mean, it, it couldn't have been clear that it wasn't open and it was like, like out of order, like not safe. And you may like, if you try to stop it, like maybe you're going to fall 50 feet or the thing's not going to run and it's going to shake. I mean, there's like nothing good could happen here. Okay. This was, this was not rocket science. And yet the elevators weren't coming on the other one. And the door was open on this one because of it being out of order. And there was an individual who I don't know, and I'm not talking about a person with a name or anything, just some person, it was a real person, that was wearing a full mask, presumably because of the, the COVID stuff. I mean, you got to understand, like, everybody I hear is vaccinated, right? But he's vaxxed, he's wearing his mask, okay. And yet he wants to, he was like very angry he couldn't get into a broken elevator. And so I know it's not a perfect analogy, and I know some of you may not get it, but it just struck me like, there was a market metaphor in here for people that are doing one protective thing that kind of doesn't make any sense to me and yet like still trying to engage in another very risky behavior. And I believe <laughs> that there is that exact same investment activity taking place every day where people are like, oh, I'm going to try to time the market to avoid stuff with COVID. But then on the other hand, I want to be all in on crypto and, and, and these hot tech, new tech companies and, 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 and you know, a lot of small cap growth or whatever the, the case may be, I could go on and on. 
there's a shiny object phenomena in investing right now that is like something I haven't seen since dot com. That dot com was was worse, I think. Uh, there's more dollars in this now, but that's 20 years later of a more inflated uh, economy. Um, but the cultural taboo back in 1999 was probably even worse. But my point, I don't know, there's metrics that make it, that would point to it being worse now and other metrics that might point to it being worse then. But one of the biggest differences is that certainly the higher caliber tech companies now are more viable and real and defensible than they were then. But when you talk about the social phenomena around what's going on, you know, both reflect a lot of craze, a lot of euphoria, a lot of um, disconnection from reality. And so disconnection from reality is where I'm going now with the rest of Divin Cafe is, you know, Joe Kernan on CNBC, I've been on his show, oh, at least 15, 20 times, maybe more than that over the years. Um, I like Joe. Um, he uh, was interviewing a money manager by the name of Kathy Wood, who I also know, who I think highly of, very, very smart woman. Uh, and yesterday they were talking about these high PE ratios, the high valuations that exist in a lot of these new hot uh, tech companies. And Joe's made the, the, uttered the statement that whenever I hear it, it perks my ears up, maybe this time it's different. Maybe these high valuations don't contract this time, even though they always have historically, maybe now they just stay higher because we're in a new world, it's a new paradigm, interest rates are low, and we're just going to have a bunch of companies that traded 100 times earnings forever or something like that. And yeah, I'll put this one to bed quickly because I think the more important comment is the one that followed from, from Kathy. But yeah, when you hear someone say this time it's different, you should be scared. This time it's different. Well, maybe this thing that we believe in, this timeless principle, this mathematical law of nature, this economic law of finance, maybe it's now obsolete. Um, because something has been going on for a while and I'd certainly like it to go on for longer. So I'm going to just sort of reconstruct my view of reality. Uh, I think that's dangerous because it does reflect someone who is probably set up for a lot of pain, but it also speaks to a complacency level in the investing public that is dangerous. And when you start desensitizing yourself from risk, from volatility, from reality, from math, I think that what generally happens is systemically quite uncomfortable. And when people start saying that house prices can never go down and that any amount of income can justify any level of mortgage, there was this sort of suspension of math, science, logic, reason uh, in nature during the, the housing bubble, the same suspension of the same things in the tech bubble the same suspension of the same things in the Japanese asset bubble um, and uh, so forth and so on. So it, people can make a fundamental argument if they want for why certain things that are very high valuation could go higher or stay the same or whatever. And every argument should be taken on its own merits. But to say my argument is that all the principles and laws are now gone and th this time it just may be different is, uh, is problematic to say the least. I'm being very charitable. Kathy then went on to say that when they look at a lot of these non-fang tech names that are smaller, that are less mature, less seasoned in the business cycle, they may be big brand names, but they're very expensive and they're, and they're high valuations. And in some cases, maybe not even making money, some cases making a little, but they're expensive. And they look out five years. She said, we're discounting those valuations. We're being hyper conservative by assuming that they may come all the way down to FANG level valuations in just five years. And I just could not believe what I was hearing. FANG as a group trades at 42 times earnings. Now, some in that group are at 70 and some are at 28. But my point is this is pretty darn expensive, okay? And, and so their earnings have been high and valuations come lower as earnings grow. And, and that should be the case of all these other high fine tech companies. She's saying that we 
are not valuing them as if they're going to get to normal valuation, but, but we think it looks good and we assume that they'll come all the way down to still 42 times earnings in five years, which is not exactly like around the corner. And I would just simply suggest that that sentence can be uttered. Because I don't, I look, a lot of those companies over five years are probably going to go out of business. Some of them are going to outperform our expectations. Some will perform in line with expectations and the stock prices will get slaughtered because you don't want to end up in five years from now at 42 times earnings. Unless you think the growth projections in the next five years are going to result in a higher projection in the future, which is just insane. So you have all the uncertainty of a long period of time to end up at a place that's basically high. What does 42 times earnings mean? It means that the company stopped growing but stayed the same and you got 100% of the profits to yourself, you would get your money back on that investment in 42 years. So, yeah. Um, this, I, I don't, I, I, we've lost our minds when we talk this way. Now, companies that are at these high valuations, some of them will pan out. Some will not, but my point is merely that we're taught, she used the word very conservative. We're talking as if this whole entire situation, that by the way, is not new. It's been going on for quite some time. You're already in the period that most of these companies have had the highest growth expansion as a percentage they're ever going to have already. And they're still going to grow and some of them prove to be good companies. You look at those FANG names. Those are all really, really good companies. But that period of like, if a company is going to do $10 of profit and then it goes to $1,000 and then every year after that, it does another hundred. Well, one year it ends up at like $5,000 of profit, but its biggest percentage growth ever was that 10 to a thousand, right? Okay. These are companies that are kind of past that part of their percentage growth. And we're talking about getting to 42 times earnings in five years and that being very conservative. I I just believe that there is a uh, mispricing of risk for a lot of the shiny objects of the investing market. And whether you want to talk about crypto, which is much harder to value because of its lack of intrinsic value, a lot of people run phases down to about 27% in the last month. It had gone down more than that a few months before that and came bouncing right back. Maybe it bounces back again. Maybe it goes down much, much further, but it's very hard to value because no one's trying to give you a projection on an earnings stream like technically we're supposed to be doing when we look at individual companies. So small cap growth is now basically flat on the year. Large cap value is up 28%, but large cap growth is still up 20 something percent. 10 companies in the S&P make up 30% of the over, I think it's 31% of the S&P 500 are 10 companies and there's 500 companies there. Um, five companies in the S&P 500. So 1% of the index makes up about 24% of the index. So that's an all time high for concentration in top five, top 10. So my point is, I, I actually think you could argue that it is logical that FANG has held up the way it has so far, because at least there you have massive balance sheets, massive cash generation, big, big brand names, there's a lot of problems, you know, they definitely have passed their peak years of growth percentage, but they still have great growth. They still have great earnings. They still have a lot of assets. They still have uh, impenetrable brand names, uh, but they do face, you know, government investigation. There's, there's, there, you, there's a mixed case, okay? I'm not even referring to the FANG stuff there. That is far more defensible to me than what I'm talking about. And when we are in an environment where people want to go get in a broken elevator and that may not even have walls, you know, to hold them from falling down a shaft. And yet they still talk about how they want to wear a mask. Something's just off. And I prefer we approach investing with a more logical, rational, reasonable, sensible calibration of risk and reward. That's my lesson in this week's Dividend Cafe. We find that calibration risk and reward more logical and rational in cash flow generation that comes from high quality companies of good balance sheets. But we do not believe in a utopian outcome here that we can do all this devoid of risk. There's still risk. We just would prefer to avoid the risk of trying to get to a 42 times multiple in five years. We prefer the risk of execution, of business interruption, of 
you know, cyclical circumstances, we diversify away that risk. But we want strong balance sheets that provide a lot of defense, high quality management. You get my point. So risk reward is the ongoing subject of an investor. I would suggest that the great investors of all time have focused on the risk part. And um, that is the world in which we live right now. I hope it's been helpful, maybe even some parts a little humorous. But at the end of the day, these are serious subjects, and I hope you're getting something out of the way we treat them here in the Dividend Cafe. Thank you for listening to the podcast, watching the video. Please go read the commentary for some great charts. And as always, rate us, forward us, tell a friend, especially a friend that's about to fall down an elevator shaft, even while they're wearing a mask. Thanks so much. Thank you.